Hi everyone, welcome to Seven Elite uh, Academy online masterclass sessions. We hope you've been enjoying uh, all the previous episodes. On today's episode, uh, I'm joined by a guest that I've known for quite uh, many years, probably over 10 years now. Uh, it's been absolutely brilliant to kind of see her journey from where she started to where she is now, and I'm sure she's going to continue to go on to bigger and better things. Today's episode, we are going to kind of be looking around the, the psychology part of the game, from the youth game, professional game, and just kind of psychology within sports in general. Uh, she's obviously, she's been part of a youth academy uh, with uh, Burnley Football Club. Uh, now she's currently with uh, Nottingham Forest, which is, uh, and she's kind of heading up the, the psych uh, department over there. And that guest is uh, Jennifer Lace. Jen, thank you. Uh, great to see you as always. And it's, uh, it's a real pleasure that we've got you here today. Hi, and thanks for having me. Yeah, I was thinking this morning why this podcast would be different or this webinar would be different to some of the others I've done. I was telling somebody actually, yeah, we go back further than either of us probably worked formally in the game. Yeah, well, what so, is yeah. it now? Over definitely, it's about 12 years. It is, yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, you know, cross paths and work together, and, and it's, it's kind of like I said, it's it's been brilliant to kind of just see your journey, you know. And yeah. you know, you were always well determined, self determined to, to kind of you know, with your university and, and doing what you do and, and to see where you are. And, and again, I'm quite fake to be honest there because I know you've achieved a lot more than just the jobs that you've kind of gained within football, and, and hopefully, we'll find out a little bit more. In fact, I think that would be a good way to start this, Jen. If, if, you can kind of go through uh, a little bit about your journey uh, to kind of all our listeners, listeners out there. Okay, yeah. So I done my A-levels, went the A-level route, so I'll go back that far. Did do psychology. Uh, be interesting for some people to know that I was kicked out of psychology A-level. <laughs> and I say kicked out in its loose term, but more the teacher basically says I was a really independent learner. And when I was around the group, I just wanted to talk to people and I just wanted to know, oh, how's your weekend been or what have you been doing? And it was unfair on some students because they didn't have that independent learning ability away from the classroom. So basically some lessons she was like, I don't think it would be great for you to be in them just because it's not fair on other people. Um, but rightly so, you know, it came to exams and stuff and I was never failing and the kind of determination and I used to go away at the same time every year which was actually a couple of weeks before exams and everybody else would kind of go out for a couple of hours drinking and stuff and I would go back like you know I'm not afraid to say it. I would go back and I'd do my couple of hours revision and sometimes teaching myself stuff that I probably yapped over in the class and um, so yeah even as far as how old's that? 17, 18. Um, I was never going to fail back then. I've made some mistakes, you know, I'm not, not going to sit here and say I haven't, but from my A-levels, I then done my undergraduate degree, and that was in sports psychology. Now, I'd done some uh, gymnastics and trampolining at quite a high level, quite um, around like a European level when I was younger, so I had a keen interest in sports, and obviously that's where we then interlinked in some of our earlier jobs around kind of borough level sports and teaching and things which has been really important in my journey and I'll come on to that a little bit because I yeah. tell I'm now a supervisor for some um, developing sports psychology practitioners with what's called British Association of Sport and Exercise Scientists uh, so I do a little bit of teaching as well on a degree and mentor uh, you know some sports like or up and coming sports psychs so and yeah. they say to me you know I can't get a job I can't get a job in sports psych so how can I develop the skills and actually a lot of the psych skills are relationship based it's talking to people it's delivering to a group it's holding a group it's recognizing what people need and actually my my earliest job was working in a gym well after my yeah. job when I was 16 and that was in the local sandwich shop and the guy was trying to teach me about different knives for different meats and I remember thinking this ain't for me. <laughs> this is not my thing. Uh, I needed to really harness the sport interest in me. Um, yeah, so I really learned quite a few skills when I was six, 17, 18, 19, doing that undergrad by working in a in a non-elite sport environment, not even a football environment. You know, I don't, as you know, I don't come from a football environment. Funnily, this morning, I've, I don't know if anyone's seen this on Twitter. 
um, they're saying get your girlfriend to do this start in 11. See how many players they know. Yeah, and yeah I've seen that. I, I didn't have no one, no yeah. sentiments. I had one striker who wasn't even a striker. And my boyfriend said to me, you work in the game. And I was like, but I just forget where they play, you know, because I see people yeah, yeah. As, as humans and I could tell you who my favourite people are. Um, and, you know, like I've had my lunch with some people that people would maybe be starstruck over. But I don't, I, I just forget because obviously when I'm watching the game, I don't really understand the game. I'm not a football fanatic, which I know is unusual being a scouser. Um, but yeah, so my actual football knowledge is not very good. But it's about really about the skills as a and the relationships as a psychologist yeah. and a psychology practitioner, someone like me, where they're so important so yeah i probably started gathering them early on alongside my degree done loads of stuff i was driving to derby county in my undergrad for one night a week so i was working till about nine o'clock and then i drive to derby county you know they were really great they put me in a hotel i do a full tuesday there full wednesday come back straight back into my job wednesday night again teach who I used to teach in the gym setting um, till all hours, loved it, you know, never complained. Uh, and it was tiring, it was. And there was times where I did think, oh, nobody else. I remember saying to my dad once, no one else has got to do this and drive two and a half hours down the motorway. Um, but, you know, stuck at it. So then from there, I've done uh, some postgrad studies. And again, just constantly connecting with people, just when you, well, even now, less so now, but more when you're younger, nobody really will ever say no, they don't want to help you. Yeah. So if you, especially now with Twitter, I think the first guy I ever contacted was on Facebook and it was through Everton's website. So LinkedIn wasn't a thing, Twitter wasn't a thing. And I found him on Everton's website, found him on Facebook and just sent him a message to say, look, I'm in my second year of studying. Um, and, you know, I'm losing a little bit of interest because a lot of it's academic and it's book work. Can I come and see just what it looks like at, at, at Everton? And he said to me, um, yes, the academy is closed because it's Christmas period, plus it's snowing, so there's not a great deal going on. But if you want to come in and have a look, you can. So I said, definitely. And I didn't see one player. Not I didn't even physically see any player. Um, I seen him. And I've seen how Everton was set up at the time. And Finch Farm was there, so it was at Finch Farm. Um, but what it gave me an understanding of is how an academy was set up. And then that gave me a barometer and some currency. So then when I met the next person, that was interesting. I could say, actually, this is similar to my visit here. Or, you know, so you don't always have to be in a pay position. That was, that's probably, if that's the attitude some people have, which it is, I work with some young up and coming practitioners and they expect to come out of an undergrad with, and have a paid job and it's absolutely not, it doesn't work like that. So, I mean, to be a practicing psychology practitioner, you do anyway have to do an undergrad, a master's and then two years supervision anyway. So there was, there's more regulation now than there's ever been, which is good because the game and sport was, and still is in some places, you know, we have loads of motivational speakers or leadership developers. I'm sorry, to, and I'm sure as well, you, you, with your, your, your kind of career being within the, within the, going into football, Jen, did you, I'm sure that you had to kind of take or you'd done it yourself, the, the FA the site courses as well along the way? Yeah, that was absolutely. After my, um, after I'd done a postgrad diploma first, so after that, I, I was on an intern at, at a club, and then I was just about to go part time originally, and I wanted to get some currency. And this is another thing that I see. There's a lot of clubs and a lot of organisations that will offer some CPD, but you also have to be willing to fund some of it yourself as well now i know we can get degrees or you know they're, they're three times now i think what i paid when i was doing mine i think i was still like three and a half grand a year but you still have to even now there's still things that i pay for regularly to kind of fund my own development so yeah that was the first one i done i was lucky i didn't have to do one two and three i think it was one two yeah and i could go straight in at four and um, because they said you're undergrad and your postgraduate studies um you know it kind of you've already got the basics of that basically so i went in on around team psychology um with the fa yeah and i loved that and i still have contacts now 
who I met on that course and they were like such young coaches back then they were either first into their job or first academy management job and eight nine years later ten years later actually you know they I see them at our conferences we go to and they say oh Jen like I've got this player what do you think or we're looking to recruit psych can you check over our job description so yeah you know just to the site courses were great. I like, I like them. I really like the um, the FA site courses. You, you build a little bit of network on them courses as well. Absolutely, and it's hard because you're often not so much now. I mean, you're still underrepresented now, but back then you were the only female, and I was really young when I started, at, especially at, at a Premier League club. I was 22 working with what used to be the 21s. So some of the players were months off being the same age as me and building that credibility you know being young being female not having any football currency it's a more of a it's still a struggle now but I'm a bit more like the furniture now I think yeah. people are a little bit bored you know and so especially at Burnley they were like Jen's off again um but yeah it was it's difficult to kind of get people to know what you know and know what you're about rather than just judging you're a girl and you've never played the game yeah and so here you are now then at Nottingham Forest in like, how long has it been? Uh, six months? Eight months? No, not, not even that. Um, I started on the 2nd of December, so December, January, okay. February. Yeah, like four months. And we were talking, saying, I don't know what normal looks like at Forest yet. Yeah. So I spent eight or nine years at Burnley obviously doing other sports part-time and, and a couple of other things going on but predominantly that football focus yeah. um came here December was about getting over to Nottingham so I've relocated from the northwest over finding somewhere to live you know just meeting meeting the club and then January I actually found somewhere to live so it's probably only February that I really could kind of start remembering the same faces twice and putting the names and saying oh that meeting's consecutively on this day and so on and then this happened in the middle of March and then all of our programs have gone online and you know players that I maybe didn't meet face to face either because they were on loan or they were off doing some other things for different reasons are now back under my remit yeah. because the football world seems to have stopped right now you know it's just there has been no normal yet at Forest for me and I don't know with the, with the whole COVID-19 yeah I don't know when normal's going to come back to to being normal again so uh well hopefully it will be sooner than later for you for that to happen but just tell me then Jen a little bit about so you, you talked about your journey around um your, your being in sports psychology but tell us a little bit about then your, your interest and your passion in wanting to get involved in sports psychology because I think that for me is it's definitely something that I, I don't know about yourself and the reason why you wanted to go down that kind of route so I think it'll be interesting and, and for all the, the viewers to, to kind of maybe understand why. So as I've previously mentioned, I worked in the gym when I was growing up and I loved teaching and I loved the energy um, and I wanted to do it forever and ever and ever. Um, but I was quite academic at school. Now I wasn't probably the top 1% in the class, but I did have the concentration when I needed to. So my dad was quite um, positive about me staying in studying. And I was lucky enough to be given a scholarship at UCLan, a sports scholarship. So that kind of started my uni journey. Um, and I, I, I don't think I've told many people this. Some people may know, but I had a really bad eating disorder when I was 16, 15, 16 where I had anorexia, I just didn't eat, and it was because of my high level of trampoline and gymnastics, it's a very aesthetically pleasing sport, so weekly you are in, daily you are in a leotard, and naturally I'm not potentially, you know, the sixth in athlete that you might see in the gymnastics teams on, on the TV, so that really probably started the whole body image and training. Um, so I decided that you know, I was going to go on a diet because I wanted to at the age of 15, like most girls do. And it was really fueled by that um, training every day, the, the competition. Obviously, you judged on everything you do, everything you wear down to your socks in gymnastics and trampolining. So that was the real environment that facilitated or that made me a little bit more at high risk of facilitating an eating disorder, basically. Um, anyway, fast forward eight months, I was really ill where I just I, I just didn't want to eat or some no that's a lie I would wake up on some days and think I want to eat but my, my head just wouldn't let me and it was really strange journey because when I was getting better 
I went to um, the hospital where they kind of say, right, they mentor, they get girls who are recovering to their mentor girls who are, or, you know, anybody that's going through it. And the nurse said to me, God, I didn't expect you to be able to talk about this the way you can do. And what she meant was I could almost see what was happening in like a third person way. So I remember thinking, why, why is this happening to me? Why can't I eat like a ham sandwich like my friends could do? You know, I've got a lovely family. I've come from a really supportive, you know, mum and dad. I'm the only child. I, I was great in school. I had great friends. I loved my sport. Why was this happening to me? Um, and it taught me so much about personality. It taught me so much about home factors, about actually how the sport and the sporting environment has had such a big impact. And then also, obviously, a personal experience of your mind and understanding self-talk and understanding a mindset and perce perception and um that really started that combined obviously with my academic interest i thought you know this could be something that is really engaging for me to do um the Everton academy used to come to my school so we had access i remember saying to my, my tutors this is what i wanted to do can you know, can I speak to the Everton lady? So there used to be an Everton lady who used to call, but I now know her as Carmel Triggs or Dr. Carmel Triggs at Chester University. Um, and she was their sports psychologist at the time. So I was lucky enough when I was maybe 17, kind of just post coming out the eating disorder physically, to have some time with Carmel and say, how, what, what do you do and how do you do it? How do I get onto a course? And she helped me. Um, so that really started it and then the more you get involved in football now this was around 2010 so I think it was just when the triple P or the guidelines were coming in that said you had to have some sports psychology support um, and the more I kind of like I'd done a couple of weeks out in Hungary and lived with a the team there and just was seeing their welfare and the lack of support there the more you see the more you really think i can add value there oh okay this is you know a, a reoccurring theme that clubs need this support but don't formally have it and that then started to really fuel the passion to take hold of the bull by its horns as such and develop it as a as a career so then going back onto your actual yeah your, your, your upbringing let's say through sports psychology just tell us then jen a little bit about your, the influences along the way but also kind of still to this day that still kind of shaped the the type of work that you do and um, the kind of the opinion you, that you have on your kind of industry and just uh, and just kind of you know some influences that have kind of shaped you to who you are today yeah so i think i don't want to miss anybody out but there's a couple of standout people in my brain is i was supervised so after my um time doing my professional um, postgrad diploma I think it was called at the time you do two years experience you pick a supervisor and I was supervised by a guy called Dr Mark Nesty and he's just retired and he is a sports psychologist he works out of John Moores and he he'd worked with Sam Allardyce at Bolton and he'd been in the first team at Newcastle and when I first met Mark I was really really young at a Premier League club with quite a bit of responsibility for my age and my experience and Mark just spoke my language. He knew football. He wasn't, although he was really, really credible in an academic sense, um, he knew the industry. He could speak the language. And I just remember thinking, you understand our world. You understand me. I wanted to work with him. So I was supervised by Mark for a, about 18 months. And every time I'd go and see him, I'd leave his office and I'd feel like I was the worst practitioner ever because he'd say have you read this have you done this did you think of this did you think of that and I'd think no no and then I'd drive to my parents in Southport so I'd drive from John Moore's to Southport thinking god I am awful at this job and that must have went on for 18 months and it's only now or no maybe a couple of years ago when you know I wasn't formally supervised by Mark anymore I thought Do you know he actually made me the practitioner that I am because every time I did go in he'd never he'd you know give me credit for some of the stuff I've done and he'd say this is good work or this is the right lines but he really challenged me With every time I, was it just constant questions constantly, you know so yeah. whenever you thought you had the answer he would knock maybe another five yeah. questions to your answer 
And I, I would, I'm not a natural, like, love, love reading person. I really have to sit and just have no distractions. Otherwise, I start talking to somebody. So I have to really, you know, crack down. Distractions? You, you put half of your uni course off because of that? <laughs> That's why I'm a good psych. People say to me now, why, why do you like working in psychology? I'm like, I love talking to people. I love to know how you are. Um, so, and he was, I remember, he would, off his bookshelf I'd say you know I'd go in dead proud of myself I've read three books which was difficult not difficult in terms of I can't read but difficult for the commitment and the, the concentration I've read these three books and he'd just whip out another three off his bookshelf and say you really need to be reading this because if you're going to operate in this industry like you need to know this and this and this and then I just feel like I was that small and I still I'm a small fish in a big pond but you know you think you're progressing a little bit and then you realize how little you do know and that still stays with me today you know I've constantly my, my move to forest I, the first thing I've done is check back in with people so bringing me on to my second influence is or my, probably my third in kind of order of when I met them Mark will be the first so he's just retired but he's got loads of good stuff out there for anyone who wants to look at psychology and he's brilliant at that top level first team working with elite players in the real first team level he's, his work is really good um, secondly would be my old academy manager Jason Blake now he currently is uh, he's just opened the first professional academy in Canada and I did do his podcast a couple of days ago which was great from a Canadian uh, point of view but he always he was totally different he, he had some understanding of psych but he came from a diff, totally different angle where he would just say to me I know you're going to be able to be one of the best sports psychs in the country you know I know that you can do this Jen if anyone can do it you know he would say to me I met this person and I think you should meet them too here's their number go and have a conversation and he really fueled uh, the belief probably in myself that I could do it all the time so he would definitely be up there I still speak to him now and then probably my latest influence would be my so when I left Burnley I moved on to the coaching team I was the only non-coach on the coaching team so that was interesting but I was part of leading our coach development because the Burnley's coach development is a lot around relationships and a lot about psychology because our of their biggest competitors are Everton, Liverpool, United and City in terms of catchment area and obviously they're not going to be able to have the resources or they've got good facilities now but they wouldn't have the kind of funding to give the same experiences as some of the big clubs yeah. so the the objectives and how we could be different was we've got to love the kids we have to make we have to love the kids and we have to get the kids to love the game and the environment and the culture was really really big there and it was psychology and behavior and relationship based so that was the where i moved into and it was really probably ian jones at burnley that you know his first day he came in and typically your sports like uh, your sports psychologist or you know even your sports psychology practitioners they will sit on the sports science team and be player facing we are taught typically to be intervention led uh, you sit with an athlete you, you know you talk about the performance maybe some broader things and you offer some guidance and pointers potentially whereas working with coaches in an environment and culture it's a different level of psychology and it's become more accepted now but it's a totally different skill um and i'm looking to do my doctorate starting this year having a couple of different options but in coach education this way in psychology coach education because it is totally different so but it was really ian on his first day i remember he said to me i want you to formally sit on the coaching team and you'll be responsible for the development of these 26 coaches from the side corner can you do it do you fancy it and i remember thinking i said yeah obviously because there's an element of I like the challenge and you know I've been at Burnley at this point all seven years and I'd always said I was getting really conscious that I didn't want to be you know you stay somewhere for a long time you become quite stagnant and I'd said the day that I stopped learning I would leave so when this when Ian came in and offered me this challenge to kind of jump ship from sports science and player facing to try and build my credibility then with the coaches and influence the culture and the environment is a different challenge for me um yeah so two like two and a half years later now that's what hopefully my research will be in my doctorate is that coach education and i probably see that as more my strength than working with players so probably them three mark jason and ian for different reasons so and you just mentioned there one of the tasks uh, that 
was given to you was um, to, to, to look at the psych uh, area around the actual coaches. So again, I think potentially a lot of people, a lot of listeners, uh, listeners a lot of viewers would just think uh, the psych is, is just there for the players. Again, so, and, you know, not excluding the staff, i.e. the coaches as well, which is just as important, really, making sure that we get the psych right with them as, more, as well with the players. So tell me a little bit more around that task, Jen, when, when that was given to you, I think, like, something maybe new to you. Mm. Like, you work with athletes, players, but this is, like, a, a different kind of ball game now. Tell me, then, some of the considerations when that task was given to you of how you were going to kind of maybe tackle that and how you were going to find success within that. Yeah, so my first challenge was to build my credibility with the coaches that I was no longer just for the players and I would sometimes go to sessions and it still happens, it happens now at Forest because they had somebody consultancy in this role before me. So, you know, if you've got such a small budget or limited resources, people say player facing first. So that's typically what coaches even at Forest do now. And it's not, you know, it's nothing against the coaches at all, but it's just a challenge to change perspective and almost turn the lens on themselves. Um, I'd turn up at sessions and their coach would say, I was thinking I'm going to observe them and their behaviours and in line with the culture that we're trying to build. And they'd say, oh, Jen, can you just watch this player over there? And you think that's, you know, last season's me would have definitely been there there you know absolutely so it's really kind of still doing what they think you should be doing to build that relationship but also moving into the new landscape of okay well actually do you realize that maybe you could accommodate that in this way or do you realize you know we looked at team talks and um, one of the things i did do was the academy manager at burnley had, had seen a model that he liked and we basically brought it to life so we had a set of descriptors then around some of the things we were looking for, which was an, you know, such a good start. And people can cringe when you say, oh, descriptors or almost prescribing ways to build relationships. You know, surely they should be authentic and natural and everybody's different. So how can you have a framework? But all it gave us was just a discussion point. So, you know, it was totally different for every single coach. And that's one of the things that Burnley, I hope, well, I know that they still do now, but pride themselves on is their approach to individual coaches' development plans are drastically different. You know, we set up one coach went on a learning difficulty uh, study day, not for him, but so that he could understand that more for his players because he felt that's what he wanted. Whereas we had another coach who probably was my my personal biggest challenge he came in he was an ex-player and that was another challenge for me in our in our back room at that time we had ex-international players and some people who were full-time butchers and part-time coaches so we had such a massive range i'm thinking how can i influence ex-international players they were two years ago playing for their country to now me saying little old me who's never played the game have you thought about this can you think about that so you know you have such a, a broad uh, spectrum of coaches that you're working with um some really open to psych which is great and they say you give them like a bit of a model and they love that um you just even have a conversation they love that others probably my most challenging coach was an ex-pro absolutely lovely person um unbelievable coach the boys loved him and that was a real again how do you get stuck into somebody and how do you help try and improve somebody that it comes in and the boys already say he's their favorite coach um but only had and i can say it now he, he only had a technical tactical lens so he was so far from my currency and i didn't have any currency to speak to him around because i don't know really anything about technical tactical stuff how was this going to work um, and it took a time, you know, I spent time where I was just around him. So I was sitting, we were probably my biggest breakthrough rhythm where I really got to see who he was and how we could approach this was I sat on the indoor, they, well, they've got a big indoor and we, he was just watching another, a younger age group. He wasn't coaching. He was just, I think he was either early or staying after his session. And I was talking to him about like who were, obviously he played. So who are his key role models? Who does he love? And it started, the bigger picture started to unravel a little bit about who he was as a person. And he was this intense as a person. His favourite player is um, Zavi, I've yeah. learned. 
and what I've heard and what I've researched about this player is he, it's all about his scanning, his decision making, the level of information processing that he goes through. And actually you can see this picture now starting to build up of this person and he says to me, Jen, I'll cancel going out for my dinner with my wife if this game's on. And he's not joking and he, you know, he's not doing it in a harmful way, but he's that intense and he's at that part of his coaching journey where he wants to know everything and he's you know, a real meticulous person and that you can see that in his coaching. Yeah. which gave me a slightly different in with him rather than trying to say have you thought about this from a psychology corner it was actually to teach it or to talk to him about what's called a frame of reference which all a frame of reference is is basically getting somebody to understand that they will perceive things based on their own core beliefs values their own previous experience and almost just to be aware that not everybody sees things the same way as you yeah. Um, so when we're teaching, especially youth athletes, it's really important to recognise that you will see things from your own frame of reference first and almost try and take that off and see it from theirs. Um, so that is then not really a, you know, a, what we would call a typical sports psychology tool of saying, try and do this. It's looking at, OK, what's influenced your journey and the things that you do? So then it, we came on to it a little bit more about he didn't really ask questions or a typical coach behavior is they ask questions and then fill it straight away because yeah. the, the group won't answer questions because they're 14 and they don't answer questions in groups so we then challenge that okay we'll look through through your frame of reference where's that come from and it probably a week or so later and this is when i knew i'd really made ground with this coach was he came back to me and he said jen i've been thinking about what you were saying and actually i've realized that oh no maybe i think the reason why i don't ask questions is because my time as a player at named his club they didn't really ask me questions so i think that's where i've got it from so actually from a psych point there you've installed some seeds for them to go away and think about yeah and, and it's the same with the players you know if you can get the ball rolling where you've had an impact on somebody's thinking they're really how we define our success and the doors open a little bit then for you to say okay well let me help you recognize that in the session should we film you should we reflect on it let's look at types of questions let's see how many times you fill the space or you know that's just one avenue but then the relationship has started um yeah and you actually make some groundwork it's fascinating to hear again you know for especially for for listeners and viewers of this about kind of peeling the layers back or how many maybe layers you've got to kind of peel back to kind of get to the sweet spots to yourself, yeah. you know, and you know, you know, as we know, you know, the it, everyone comes in in different ways and, and different ways of thinking and different backgrounds, and it, it, it is it's fascinating to kind of just hear some of the things that you you've got to do with certain people uh, compared to other people as well. So, but then, so they, that was the stuff with the coaches. So then, let's go back to kind of your current. Um, I say current obviously position um with what you do in terms of kind of kind of heading up a, like a psych department what does then yourself within your position what does kind of the relationship and and kind of with between yourself with the coaches in terms of some of the projects that you may have in place or something that is kind of put on your table to kind of go and um, observe assess feedback, work with that player, and then how does it then yourself within your position connect with the coach, first team manager? Because you've been now at quite a few different football clubs and I'm sure you've seen kind of different systems and different how things operate differently in terms of kind of communications and kind of putting feedback on the table and uh, results on the table. So how does that kind of work then uh, from psychology to the coaching team? um it's you gotta have an open team yeah. so one of the things and, they, and really working with your coaches and working with your backroom staff that's where you have potentially the most impact as well because it's i'm really personally my i like an approach where you do have both because i think it's really healthy for the athlete to have their own individual strategies and self-awareness so that they can take that if the manager leaves or if the you know their, their lead coach leaves or whatever it looks like they can or they leave they go on to another club you know they take that with them i think that's really really healthy um but then the you take somebody with really great 
uh, coping strategies and self-awareness and you put them in an environment that potentially doesn't allow them to flourish and doesn't allow them to or facilitate them that person's development and actually you're going to crush the athlete so it's that's why that balance between the environment and the, the culture with the coaches as well as the player individual strategies is really really important for optimal performance you know you, you wouldn't really get one you wouldn't get optimal performance without having both yeah. um you know the players who tend to have that the maybe traits that are kind of attractive in football the ownership the responsibility the leadership skills the determination that we probably see in youth sport and youth talent id they tend to get picked up and put in a massive environment and culture that is more positive for them than maybe a grassroots team or you know a, a smaller category three or academy because such a club can provide them the culture and the environment and they do tend to kick on because that's you know you, you, the disposition they hold in that environment is so important so it's difficult because it's now becoming a little bit more accepted for psych within the coaching team um but you i find i'm finding i think for me it was a given by the time i left at, at burnley that that's what we were doing with the coaches one of the best coaches i ever have worked with in, a, in that coach development role came from um potentially the biggest club in the world to Burnley for different reasons obviously but and I worked with him and he his level of understanding of the game and how he was with the younger athletes was phenomenal and I really thought how am I going to work with this guy and actually we it was brilliant because it was a two-way working relationship so but not everybody is that forward accepting and thinking so it's really I'm finding now God, why, why don't they know that that's just how coach ed works why don't they know that they're the types of things i'm looking for in sessions so it's really about the game building the trust it's about being patient seeing your opportunities to almost add some knowledge and add some value or add the right questions um, and the right feedback at the right time you know there's sometimes when i've listened to conversations and thought obviously so new into the role and forest have been brilliant so open in terms of saying come in lead us because you're the specialist in this area um, create, and that one of my KPIs is to build them something strategic. Yeah. So, um, you know, kind of everything I'm doing, I'm thinking with a lens if I left or if that coach left, would that still exist? Is that still a pathway? Um, can we recognize that? And, you know, you can't change everything when you first go in because straight away you're going to have your resistance off your coaches. Now, that the, probably the greatest thing about what I do, and um, sometimes some psychology practitioners like me, is because we don't really know the technicalities of the game me standing at the side of a training pitch isn't a threat as maybe having a b licensed coach stand at the side of the training pitch who might have a psychology lens because the technicalities of the drill we're not judging and although everyone might stand and say that if you have some contextual knowledge that can still still be perceived as a threat and actually so you know we've got some great coaches that's talking to me and i think i couldn't tell you what you've just been trying to work on or I have to ask yeah. and getting used to getting um, comfortable with asking silly questions. I say all the time, guys, I know this might sound ridiculous, but can I just ask, what is this? Or what do we do for this? And especially, obviously, it's a new club, it's different. So I'm constantly trying to learn about what we've got for psych because we do do psychology, every, all of us do. You know, the whole probably from Alex Ferguson where you don't need a psychologist because your coach is the psychologist there's arguments for that um i guess what we're trying to do and one of my aims is just to bring the self-awareness of what you do and why and then if it's working let's strategically do it a little bit more but it's knowing why yeah. so um probably an easy example is as coaches we manipulate you you guys manipulate sessions for different scenarios for different pressure um and then we the likes of me turn up and say have we do do we do any pressure training you don't know no no what, what do you mean pressure training oh well and then we might you know kind of present a lovely model of proven ways to manipulate a session and give you some currency to label what you're doing and then you say oh i'm going to do that three times this week or i'm going to do that only twice next week and i don't agree with that one so it's not always i genuinely personally believe that a good sports psychology practitioner wouldn't tell you what to do and we've been having a, I was on a course this week, a Zoom course for five hours. Like that's now a thing in lockdown, you know, who knew? But anyway, <laughs> um, where we were talking about sometimes when to be 
when to, when we have to lead and when we can just offer a range of experiences or, or solutions and interventions because if you went to the doctors or surgeons and the surgeon started saying to you as a, as a client or as a patient oh well we could fix your broken leg like this or like this or like this or maybe like this which one do you want you'd think as a patient I don't really want to go with you at all. So it's really having that fine line of recognising and having a relationship with your coaches to know when to say, have you tried this? And when to say, what do you think about these things? So I work with a great coach at the minute and he's an absolute forest legend. And obviously I'm not a football person, so I was not privy to this. And he's a really um, high performing person. You know, he, he likes to absorb everything, really open book, but he will say, show me what it looks like and then let me decide. You know, so give me an example and then I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you about it. Whereas some coaches don't want the example. They want to come up with the example themselves. Okay. So it's totally well, different. It's open mind, isn't it? At least they're, they're receptive for psychology to, to kind of come up with examples, show examples, and then obviously for the coaches to, to kind of make an opinion on that. Absolutely. I, you know, I'm really proud to work for this club, especially during lockdown for that reason, because I spoke to people in other clubs, coaches and psychs and, you know, head to coaching in other clubs where I've said, what are you doing for the athletes at this time? And they're like, nothing. You know, we're just going to go and let them be yeah. be human beings. And, and, and that's it. And that's, you know, a one person's decision or a lead coach's decision. And actually, we've had a really collaborative approach where, our, you know, our lead guys are saying, what does everybody think? So Jen, what, what, what do you think from a site corner? Do we want contact? Do we not? Do we put on extra stuff? Do we not? Do we structure the day like daily? Do we make things mandatory? Do we not? Um, you know, we're asking the fitness guys constantly all the time. We have meetings where we just say, are we on the right track? Does anybody want to change the course that we proposed at this rate every bloody two days ago? But, you know, not to say anything's right or wrong, but just because everyone's learning. Uh, and it just kind of reflects that forest mindset that I've gone into where they, they are really open. Yeah, really open. Brilliant. So, Jen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw this now to the actual youth game now. Um, I think for all our listeners, viewers, I think that we definitely kind of would be really interested to, to learn more about the, the work around and maybe surrounding pressures within uh, within academy football, youth football, whatever it may be. So we, we look at the, the youth game. Let's look at the, uh, the academy system. Um, and let's kind of just throw some pressures in. Uh, okay, what kind of pressures? So pressures from a really young age to try and sign for the club. Um, you know, pressure from parents, pressures from, uh, you know, injury setbacks, returning from injury, uh, you know, find um, high performance again, high perfor high level performances, pressure from age, you know, you've got agents now uh, within the academy game, believe it or not, uh, pressure to find or get that uh, apprenticeship contract, pro contract, pressure to try and get into the first team. And there's just so many kind of different pressures coming in from all different angles, Jen. And I'm sure you've probably come across many experiences where a lot of athletes have some way uh, have kind of felt some of these kind of pressures and it's kind of affected them uh, mentally and, and definitely within the performance and uh, within their performances. How, I'm not going to ask you to, to kind of go through each and every one that I've just said. They were just examples, top of my head. Um, but just kind of give us a little bit of uh, experience of maybe coming around players that do go some of the, go through some of them pressures and some of them experiences and, and how can we, from a psychology point of view, to support some of these type of individuals that do kind of feel um, pressured. Yeah, it's a huge point that you make an answer around pressure. Um, it, the, the short answer is it looks different for different age groups in terms of our approach to supporting and trying to manage that pressure. Um, I think th the younger we go, well, it's so important right the way through, but in terms of pressure from like parents, pressure to train really well, pressure not to make mistakes in games, um, we have to keep it fun. And uh, you know, all of our psych research tells us that we do things as human beings, you know, forget the models, but actually we do things when we enjoy it. 
So a, a child now will sign potentially a pro at 14, um, sorry, a scholarship at 14, which kind of secures them then to, you know, like um, where other clubs can't take them until that time, it's like a pre-contract um, at 14. And they've probably been in the system since they were seven or eight. So by the time they get to 16 on that scholarship um, contract, they've had a, they've had a nine year mini pro career anyway where they've gone into an unbelievable academy or a structured system where there's badges they've got a first team they've got a football head of coaching of football and they've got nice cars in the car park and they've got lovely watered pitches and you know or they even even little things like some of the smaller academies where there may be a cat three little things children are receptive to so they'll notice that the fridges are all organized or there's different posters on the wall and you know there's old um, pros that have made the debut all over the academy. There's inter inspirational quotes. It's it's the, the, yeah. the, 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 details, yeah. the little details. Yeah, absolutely. And kids pick up on them um, examples and the the things in their environment so easily. They can all create pressure. Just the fact that they put on a different kit to go into training and that can start pressure. So we have to keep it as fun as we can for as long as we can because what ultimately, from a psych perspective, we're trying to do is develop that intrinsic motivation so if they if they enjoy it and they're then intrinsically motivated to do it they're more likely to do it more and for longer anyway and we kind of forget that at some ages where we're trying to have the best i want the best psychology department so of course i want psych input for our eight nines and tens you know analysis they want the best analysis department so they're trying to do stuff so it doesn't necessarily come from a negative perspective where we're like they need they need they need this but we all want the best for what we're doing and sometimes the nature of that can kind of overload our players in lots of different ways so especially you know we've got to keep it fun looking at parents i worked with a player i'll give you an ex a specific example as i've just mentioned earlier i when by the time i left burnley i didn't really work with players which was hard because players that i had worked with and then all of a sudden you jump to the coaching team and I'm not saying I stopped working altogether, but I, my time could no longer be player facing doing one to one intervention stuff daily. And the lads would say to me, Jen, like, we don't have any workshops with you anymore. Or, and you know what, lads' banter's like, they'd say, oh, she doesn't care about us now. She only cares about the coaches. And although, like, that's funny and they're laughing, you, you still feel it. You still think, do they, you know, do they mean it? Like, I, I care for them more than ever. You know, I, like, I still love you. Like, it's hard. It is hard. But I, was walking onto a youth uh, a foundation phase so i think this player was under nine so i think he was eight years old uh, sunday morning i was just going to observe the coaches and the player was like with his mom and they were at the back on their own and burnley's training ground is quite a long walk from the the building to the far pitch and liverpool similar as well actually um and this kid was sick just in front of me i was just walking along on my own he was sick and Obviously, like I was straight away asking, are you okay? And his mum says to me, I think it's anxiety. Now, he was really new to us. I mean, like one, two weeks new to us. Um, so we didn't know a lot about the child because he was brand new. And, you know, we, we I think he'd been on his trial and we knew about the family. But, like, again, things that present themselves in the environment don't always happen on in the week of your trial. So, you know, it's not saying that we didn't do enough to know about the child, but it was purely that on this Sunday morning he was sick. Yeah. So anyway, he was sick once and then he was sick again. And he stood up and he said to me, I'm ready now. And I said, you ready? He said, yeah, um, I have to be like this. So I said, what do you mean? You have to be like this. He said, every time I play football, I have to be like this. And he'd come from a massive club, not far from us. Um, and he's, anyway, would you, like, I said to him, do you want me, do you, no, I said to him, do you want me to tell the coach that you've, do, should we tell the coach that you've been sick? He was like, no, I don't want to tell him. So I'm like, do you want me to tell him? No. Well, you know, you've got to think about, you might be a little bit dehydrated now and you might be a little bit tired earlier because you've now got no breakfast because it's on the floor back there. And, you know, should we just tell him just in case, you know, and you really sell it to the kid that this is the right thing to do. And he said, oh yeah, yeah. Okay, well you tell him for me, not a problem. So anyway, it tells the coach, speaking to the mom, this child is regularly sick on a game day. And she said, this starts Saturday night. And this is an eight year old. And the bit that really got me was that he said, I have to be like this. 
and that he's almost created the narrative where at eight years old that he associated this sickly feeling and this anxious feeling weekly with football and that was how it had to be for the rest of his life and you just think you know take off your side hat for a sec from a i don't have children but from a human perspective the pressures that even that we don't even consider such as putting on the kit such as driving his mum said to me so again Burnley it's a long drive it's on a national trust park so there's a long drive into it and she said you should see him by the time we get to the gates when he starts he loves it and every week we say to him you know you don't have to go um and he's like no no i want to go she said but we have this weekly so we we it was a huge eye opener to me to really see how bad it can be that we take for granted we think we're sitting on our high tables talking about building great relationships and we're all trying to do the best but actually again you know, there are so many pressures for the kids um at that bottom end we've got to make it as friendly and as fun and get the technical tactical knowledge that you're trying to install at that age across in the most unthreatening way you know that we possibly can um that's a younger age do you want me to talk a little bit about the kind of 18 plus age yeah so i think with this then so kind of going forward if if you were to kind of maybe if you've got an example or you've got a, a case that you, you worked on in the past then is how do you then so you come across a, a player or an athlete or a task so you've just kind of mentioned one there about that kids um how then would you in terms of kind of build your relationships with that athlete yeah, to then kind of do your work or for your work to kind of really prevail in terms of kind of you know getting the athletes performing better um, the well-being um, mental robust mental strength whatever it may be yeah so how would you then especially with a maybe a teenager let's say Mm -hmm. How would you kind of do your work with like a, a teenager and, and how would you build your relationships to kind of, again, try and get, hit the sweet spots with them? Um, with the teenagers, they think they know more than you, as we know, in some cases. Um, but one of the big things for me is being consistent. Players come in the building and they have that many people around them in terms of sports science. Then you might have a, a part-time sports scientist. Then you might have three rotating physios. Then you might have two different coach and a floating coach. Then you've got a head of coaching and then you've got an academy and manager. You know, they can have so many people around them. Um, and we're all really busy doing different things that we think is right, that it's easy to forget the small details that kids remember. So if you say that you're going to be at a, at a session or you say that you're going to speak to a player's mum or that you'll see them Thursday, then you have to stick with that. So there's, I had some work with some, some of our team players um, not so much performance focused stuff but more just around helping them settle into our club and you know the typical coaches were saying we don't really can't really get through to him and you get somebody else's opinion on he's moody or he, where you know he doesn't like it here um so you know you really kind of i was just invested in him like i had and it, you know some psych psychology practitioners will do this some won't but i specifically used to make sure that I had my dinner at the same time, like my evening meal at the same time as this player. And I'd sit with him. And I mean, I know he, now I think, God, he must have thought this is so uncool. Like, why does Jen sit with me like three nights a week and have a dinner and just talk to me about school and stuff? But I know he doesn't because since I've left, you know, he was, I've seen him when the youth team played the youth team and stuff. And it was really like a really authentic, how are you doing? You know, and he obviously gave me a little bit of banter about being a traitor and stuff like that. So that was cool. But yeah, I sat with him and you know, you've got to get used to being uncomfortable. It's the first time you sit with a 16 year old player that's come from one of the biggest clubs in the world. And they're like, who are you? Uh, and you're there saying, okay, what, what school do you go to and how has how your day been? What does it look like? And you're really trying to understand. And then, as I say, by the time I left, if I wasn't at dinner, he would be like, I didn't see you at dinner time. You know, I had to have my yogurt on my own. And, you know, they end up kind of looking for you and just having, again, the same face and they expect you to just be there and speak to them. It really is about being consistent. When, when I left, there was a couple of players that, although, again, I wasn't player facing, where you just build some relationships and I've done a, a bit of work with them because 
as I say, sometimes you're a human being and you say, we can't let that happen. And if you don't have any other resources, resources, then I will always step in and try and do that. But I made an extra effort to tell them first I was leaving. So it was done. They didn't hear it off somebody else and they felt valued and they knew that the time we'd built a relationship and, you know, the advice that I had given them, the support, the family and so on was authentic as well. Not just because you had to, because it was a Tuesday night at five o'clock kind of thing. So yeah, it's real persistence with and trying to understand their cultures like I've learned. So it's made me feel really old, but I've learned so much about somebody asked me once if I was active on a named a random social media site. One, I didn't even know what active on that meant. Um <laughs> And I didn't even know what the you know what the app was, so I was a bit like, oh god. Another time, I was trying to draw something to a player. I, I, he was seventeen, and I'm drawing a computer, and I've drew the real old style of computer where it's the the, the keyboard, the box screen. And he knew. I said, well, I'm going to draw a computer, and I'm going to draw a couple of other things. So he has turned around and drawing it, and as I've drawn the box and the four lines off the back, as you would, he says to me, "What's that?" This is a computer. And he wasn't being funny. And he says to me, oh, yeah, yeah, you're drawing one of them old types. I'm like, I need to start drawing iPads and loving other things. So, yeah, you know, this is really how we have to engage. We have to see it all the time. Like, what would it look like for a 17-year-old? And what it looks like from a 17-year-old from, you know, inner city London or, you know, even some parts in Liverpool compared to the boarding school kids or the, the which we do have. Uh, all the privately educated children, um, lads that come in is just totally different. So it's about that investment in the time, consistency, authenticity, you know, talk to them about non-football things at first. I say to them, what's your favourite takeaway? And they look at me, don't eat takeaway. And I'm like, really? You know, and it's showing them that this kid can still be a human being and I'm a top performing athlete. I don't have hot chocolates. I only have green tea, really, because you're 16 and I know you probably have a McDonald's weekly, which is okay. You know, I'm not a sports scientist. Yeah. My job is to get you to understand yourself. Yeah. So, yeah, it's really being uncomfortable in them situations and just kind of sitting in that uncomfortableness and letting them think that at first you're a weirdo um, to build the relationship, yeah. Yeah, and do you know what? How many times do we hear that kind of saying, of, or not saying, but just putting yourself in, in uncomfortable situations, whatever it is that you're trying to pursue, will is always going to kind of, you know, bring you out best eventually in terms of whatever, whatever it is that you're pursuing, whatever it is that you're trying to achieve and so on. But uh, I can imagine yourself within psychology that you have got to do that on a regular basis, Jen, because you're working with so many different kinds of personalities, um, not just the athletes, but let's just say personalities, because the game, you know, it, it goes from player, athlete, coach, sports scientist, uh, head of coaching, academy director, parents. We, like I said earlier on, there's, there's agents as well at some point that are going to be coming, putting pressures on on players at certain ages, the older ages. But uh, it is, it's, it, again, it's, it's a great lesson to, to kind of hear all this. But then in terms of mental health, now, mental health, we, I, I think the awareness of mental health is, uh, is never being better, but that's not to say that it can't get any better. Of course, it can always get better about the awareness of mental health. And we were speaking uh, to Neil Bailey from the, the PFA, and he mentioned that probably one of the biggest things that's kind of evolved within the game over the last maybe five to 10 years is the awareness of mental health. Um, you see more around the psych area. Uh, you see more clubs uh, utilise the, the psych departments and, and, and the PFA have definitely done that uh, with their kind of, you know, the Prof Professional Footballers Association. But from mental health then, from kind of clubs, academy, uh, coaches, from the professional and, and also grassroots, and this also for parents, you know, what things is there out there, Jen, that we, let's just say, from a, a real kind of limited uh, level of knowledge of, of the psych area, can we do or access that we can get or resources that we, A, as maybe a, a coach or a grassroots coach, can maybe just kind of support our players or even as a, as a parent 
that we've got kids that are, you know, every single week are in kind of sport and activities. You know, it's the simple things that we can do just to kind of support our kind of kids, our younger players' mental health, kind of going through their, their kind of childhood within sports. Yeah, so I think you're right in what you're saying and what Neil has said from the PFA about the development. When I started in football, there was psych wasn't even accepted. We safeguarding was not really considered, and more so now, player care wasn't a thing. Um, and actually, now we have formally you have to have somebody in psych, obviously at different levels, but predominantly in your academies, anything I think it's three has to have some level of provision. Um, category three and all you have to have safeguarding now and you have to have player care so that you know the expansion of them three roles has been challenging but as you're saying it's good and we still have an ironed out exactly where sits where sometimes so for example often your psych wouldn't necessarily work with mental health and but what it why it kind of sits with psych is because often they're best placed within the system to identify and support and kind of signpost maybe to safeguarding or the relevant resource like you're saying. Um, so yeah, th there is that to think about. Some clubs like what we did will advertise and will want, like I've upskilled myself in terms of doing some counselling and psychotherapy. The doctorate that I'm you know, gonna do has an element of CBT and it sits within the School of Counselling, not the School of Sport. So again, you're just getting more skills all the time. Um, and then there's another thing that we haven't really mentioned as well is the we're now seeing more and more sports psychiatrists who are you know real um, psychiatry practitioners and doctors that apply now in a sporting context. So the the developments like you're saying there, that's how I see it from our from my experiences of clubs and academy development in terms of how we use that you know it's great to sit and say we have player care like since I've been on this our player cares message me and at the moment we're busier than ever because of lockdown and the lack of structure that there is and that contact there is because of physicality we I mean, we're really really busy checking and challenging all our athletes we've had some of the best discussions and that's really where it starts is having discussions especially mental health this is not sport specific but it is just talking it is giving the athletes asking them when they come into the session then maybe using that as space to say how's your day been letting them say rubbish letting them say i'm sad about this or we a really good activity that i love is or probably one thing that we know is that children struggle to label their emotions and boys in particular so anybody who is in a, you know in a male academy you you've got a double vowel challenge there um now it takes no resources and it takes a little bit of common knowledge to think well if they struggle to recognize their emotions how do they tell us how they're feeling so it's trying to make that pathway easier. So a, an activity I love is just getting them to label emotions. So you can cut out, you could write down a load of emotions and cut them out. And as your players are arriving, just get them to match maybe some of the descriptors with the emotion and getting them able to. So I, I worked with an under 15 a couple of years ago that got, um, he got concussion in the game. Well, he was airlifted. It was a real traumatic experience. He was airlifted to the hospital. And in some of our um, psych rehab as such, back in, he, we were re-watching the point of contact and so on. And I could see him squirming a little bit. So we'd stop it and we'd revisit and so on. And I'd say to him, how does that make you feel? And he said, oh, it makes me feel excited. And this is a 15-year-old, you know, and he's probably, he's still at Burnley, so it's not Forest, but he was, his, you know, dad, unbelievable family, lovely people, really um, articulate in, in who they are and what they were about. Lovely, you know, great, great family that you'd like to work for, work with as parents of everyone who's athletes. And I said, excited. And he said, yeah, when I watch it, I feel excited, like my tummy feels all bubbly and I feel really tense and I don't really want to watch it again, Jen. And actually, when we unraveled it, he didn't feel excited, he felt anxious and he felt anxiety. But a typical young male couldn't label his emotions correctly. And when you stop and think about that, you think, actually, why would they be able to? Because they never get taught it. So. And again, as well, how many times was would anyone maybe just kind of take for what that kind of kid says and just and leave it as that and then just kind of walk on and then you've got another 
maybe 15 players to kind of listen to what they say. And you just kind of take it through without kind of, again, peeling back the layers and finding out, well, what are those feelings? Well, actually, that's not excitement. That's actually potential anxiety. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, it's it's how many times do we just kind of take, take the word for it and just kind of move on? And then in years to come, that could be the actual factor of, you know, a stumbling block. Yeah, we hear so many players as well coming out saying, I work with guys now, coaches now who've played at, you know, they've played for big clubs and they say that it comes out afterwards and it comes out afterwards. Like I was on a physio treadmill overlooking the training pitch and I just felt so dead inside or, you know, because nobody either asks or I spoke to a first team player, not for Forest today, but I'd done a bit of consultancy with a couple of athletes previous. Obviously, he's still keeping in touch with them. And I asked him today, so he's going through a bit of a stressful time. Um, how are you feeling? And he said, fine. And I said, oh, yeah. And he said, yeah. And I said, OK, how are you really feeling? And he said, fine. And he started laughing. And um, I said, you know, I'm always going to ask you how you feel. And he started laughing and he said, well, you don't have to. I said, I know, but I always will because you will always at some point then say, because he's done it previously as well, but then say, oh, well, actually, do you know what? Yeah, this is going on or, you know, and some things are really positive that we want to celebrate. So it's great that if you're genuinely feeling like that, but again, it's asking the same question once asking again and making a point. You know, people think you have to be a mind reader, but making a point of saying, actually, truthfully, are you really feeling that? Or, because if you are, Brill, you know, I'm not trying to put problems into your brain because I know that's another thing that people think psychs often do, but just merely asking and re asking and re asking. And if you know somebody's maybe had a bad day one day, there's nothing wrong with the next training session making a bit of a beeline for that player and asking him again today, How's your day been? Was yesterday better than Tuesday? You know, really trying to use the language that the child will understand and probing. Yeah. yeah. So, and Jen, you know what, we're coming towards the end of this and this has been, you know, brilliant. And again, we can't thank you enough for, for your time to, 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 to spend with uh, Seven Elite Academy online masterclass session. Just before we kind of wrap this up, Jen, and, um, you know, we, we just talked about how, how psych has developed, let's just say over the last maybe 10 to 15 years within, within football. You know, what would you kind of like to see kind of going forward or is there anything that you would like to maybe see develop more for the, for the future of psych within, within football, but also within sports? Yeah, I think, there's, it, I think it's on the cusp as well of um, we're looking more now about how we learn. So it's moving even further on from mental skills to get the best out of your performance. Yeah. Um, looking more towards environment and culture and ultimately we're starting to lap into kind of neuroscience about how do we learn what do we know about the brain that we can really harness um, so I'd love us to be able to get like a learning specialist in um, there's some really active guys on Twitter we're, we're kind of on the cusp where the coach development and coach developers are the like the new toys which is great and we may spend another couple of years here but I do start now seeing this, this movement towards how do we process information within the session, um, learning scientists, that would be really great. And there's always going to be scape, scope to have different types of psychologists or psychology people within, within sport. So the sports psychiatry, like I mentioned, I think one of the greatest things that the English Institute of Sport have done is they created a mental health panel. So it wasn't just psychology practitioners within sports, uh, but a sport, individual sport level. It was really as a governing body, they created a team of doctors, psychiatrists, psychologists, um, counsellors from different backgrounds as well. Educational psychologists, again, for educational purposes. Um, and they've kind of created that steering group to then decide and help them upskill the different practitioners within each sport. You know, I'd love in five years time to sit here again and say, do you know what, Forrest, we have me, we have a clinical psychologist, we have a behavioural specialist in this area, or this guy's come on board because he's learning and technology specialist. Because it really is about trying to understand how we can, you know, get people, influence people's thinking and learning in the right way for what we're trying to achieve. So yeah, I'd love that. Brilliant. With the unlimited 
a little bit go through as well, Jen. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> and like the, the last question I'm going to uh, ask you, Jen, and that this is again mainly for, for anyone out there who wants to kind of you know follow and, and research um, uh, psych and, and some of the, uh, the people, some of your influences that you mentioned earlier on. So tell us, Jen, out there on, on like social media in particular, is there anyone out there that we we can follow, the, anything that, any kind of um, websites or stuff that we can do to kind of learn more around psych and, and pick up some, some good things along the way? Yeah, so just to make it really clear, I'm not affiliated to any of the websites, you know, really just focused on Forest. It's not a sales plug at all. They're just genuine resources. Um, Belief Perform is a really good one for us at the moment. And the, I think the caution for Psych is making sure that the resources you do use are run by people with the right training. And Belief Perform is um you know it's got a good team behind them and they're constantly they don't just develop uh, sports resources either they develop school ones home ones so you've got infographics you've got written articles um that's really great another one for any parents who may be listening of young athletes or even coaches to be fair i've used this for some of our youth athletes and it's a new resource i've discovered it's called the big life journal they have an instagram they have a twitter um, but they've got some great activities for that you can do with your athletes as well. The Magic Academy is another one. They're really active on Twitter. I, I'm assuming they've got a Facebook page and things, but I've, I've only seen them on Twitter. They're doing weekly webinars as well at the minute. And the guys who are leading that come from England Rugby. Okay. Um, so they're really good. And again, that kind of creativity in your coaching about asking questions. I bought some cards off them which were um, like coach challenge cards around psych. Right. So great tools. I think they cost me about six pounds, seven pounds. So that's really good if you're a coach. Um, I'm trying to think what else. And the Dan Abrams podcast, they're also really good. And also he's good for any, if there's any young athletes listening or again, parents who your child has got Instagram because he kind of, he's not very, he doesn't post lots of kinds of scientific articles in your face now, but what he does post is underpinned by them science articles. So, but he posts them in a really easy, digestible way. Um, and then he does similar to what we're doing here, but it's purely psych focused around different psychology practitioners, what they're doing. So again, you can learn from them. They had some really, he's had some really credible guys on there until he asked me to do it, which was his last one last week. So it might go downhill from there. Um, but yeah, Dan's, Dan's really big, you know, he, on Twitter, he's really active as well. Great with his researchers and really kind of helping people understand the research. Yeah. So from a side corner, they're, they're absolutely the ones that I would maybe say across the platforms. That's excellent. I know definitely myself, I'll be giving them a check, Jen. And I think, you know, for, for all our listeners and viewers out there, I think, you know, that's uh, some, some kind of great kind of um, insights of, of who we can follow and, and, and the things that we can do even more uh, around the psych area and, and bring it into, into our game and in, into our profession as coaches, parents, whatever we are in terms of what, whatever position we are within the game. But... Jen, um, what I will say, we, we always talk about the, the growth of the girls' game and we always think about that, about girls actually playing like, in, in, the, in, the, in the women's game. We don't necessarily always think about actual the growth of the girls' game in terms of what women and what girls are doing just within the game in general, whether it's you know, within the women's, whether it's within the men's. So to see someone like yourself as uh, you know, lead, kind of one, one of the leading females is, is doing it within the males game is is actually you know it's brilliant jen um again you know i'm proud to kind of see where you are today and it, we can't thank you enough to to take the time out and and spend um yeah your, your morning with us jen so thank you again and um and, and we hope yeah you, you have a a normal season very soon jen so do we so do we thank you for having me on as well